So uh, welcome to panel A. So Carl, you can start. Uh, yes, so welcome. I guess this is panel eight, the history and geography of cotton, what all fashion students should know. And we have four members of this panel, Sven Beckert, Jeffrey Silberman, Alison Gill, and Buxton Mediet. I hope I pronounced your last name correctly, Buxton. And you can remove that slide. All right, and I thought that I wanted to hear from the members of the panel why you're working with cotton. What is it about cotton that attracts you? Why have you devoted so much time to this little fiber? And Allison, do you want to start? You might be on mute. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to start. Um, it is a little fiber, but um, it's one that's greatly in the news, as I'm sure you've all heard in the past couple of weeks related to labor abuses in East Turkestan, which is the Uyghur homeland in, in Western China, also known as Xinjiang. But I've been working on cotton for a long time, in fact, because of labor abuses that tend to be associated with cotton. Um, my work focuses on uh, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, two republics in former in Central Asia and former Soviet Union, as well as the Uyghur region of China. And you know, cotton is a really important issue for um, global supply chains, for fashion, for home goods, and it's also been a really important crop in these regions. And um, all right, I, I that's that's yeah. that's fine for an introduction. Sure. Uh, Buxton, what about you? Very good. Thank you for uh, having me for this panel. Uh, my name is Buxton Yet. I'm the vice president uh, of, for marketing and promotions for Supima, uh, representing the uh, 500 family farms that grow uh, American Pima cotton in the U.S. I've been in the cotton industry since 1989. Uh, time has flown. Um, I really started off really I was drawn to it because of my interest in uh, international trade. Uh, I've been studying Latin America, speak Spanish and Portuguese. And uh, of course, this is, you know, a very international uh, supply chain and just loved working uh, with the industry and the textile uh, and that interface to help bring together the, the raw materials uh, uh, with the uh, textile. Industry players and and um, so right. that's, that's my what, intro what there. About, what about you, Jeff? Well, I'm not sure I can answer the question on why it happened, or I, I can tell you how it <laughs> happened. Um, uh, as you know, I'm a professor recently retired from FIT and the past chairperson of the textile development and marketing department. Uh, concurrent with that, though, I was a consultant to the International Cotton Advisory Committee uh, Secretariat. Um, and that's uh, 39 intergovernmental organizations that have an interest in fostering a healthy cotton sector. And my specific role was to develop uh, what was called the International Forum for Cotton Promotion. And uh, the IFCP uh, focused on developing uh, domestically funded and domestically focused programs to increase cotton demand within uh, various countries that we worked with. Uh, so the idea was basically if we could improve the demand within individual countries, then eventually cotton demand uh, would rise all through the world. And before that, I was doing USA, USAID projects with natural fibers, including Egyptian cotton, but also uh, Mongolian cashmere and Russian linen and a few others. So I've been involved in natural fiber program development uh, for many years. Okay, very good. Uh, and what about you, Sven? I think you're mute. Okay, I guess I'm the odd guy out here because I came to cotton not because I work with a fiber, not because I'm trying to grow it, not because I'm trying to sell it, but uh, because I'm a historian of the United States and of global capitalism. And uh, I wanted to write a book that brings U.S. history into a global perspective, and I wanted to think about how the global capitalism in which we all live today, how that came into being. 
And it dawned on me at, at some point that to tell a history of that fiber, to tell a history of, uh, of cotton during the past uh, 4,000 years would be a way to embed US history in a global perspective, and it would be a way to uh, come to a different kind of understanding, a more global understanding of the long history of capitalism. All right, and by the way, I, I have the, this book here, and you, I don't know, can you see there's a lot of notes taken here carefully underlined and question marks and, and stuff. So um, I also came to Cotton from sort of an historic point of view. I developed a class at FIT called American History through uh, fabric and fashion. And so we look at history by looking at what people wore and, and also how uh, fabric is made. And part of the reason why I developed that class, because I thought it was so fascinating that the cotton gin was invented in 1793. So after the constitution passed, and I always thought, what would have happened if the cotton gin had been invented before? What would have happened if the cotton gin hadn't been invented at all? Uh, what would America's history have been like? So I just thought that that relationship was very, was fascinating. And I also realized that none of my students had any idea about this. And these obviously are students who are interested in fashion one way or another. So that's gonna be my second question. And just to get this sort of out of the ballpark is what, what do you think that fashion students should know about cotton? And this is sort of from your mouth to my classroom. What, what do you want me to tell students about cotton? And Sven, we could um, start with you. Uh, I think you should start by assigning my book. And I think that will answer almost all questions you can have about <laughs> history. Yeah. But obviously what I would suggest to your students is they need to know something about uh, the, the history of, uh, of, of cotton, if that is the material that they're working with so much. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, one, you know, they can learn a lot of things from engaging with that history, but maybe for you students in particular, what I would like them to understand is how they are going to become part of a very global system of the production of uh, textiles which they are designing and that this system begins on farms and on plantations in very many different regions of the world. Uh, the cotton is carried by merchants to many different other parts of the world where it's spun and woven into fabric and then it's manufactured again elsewhere and they are part of this long commodity chain that is uh, really quite, uh, quite central to the long history of the modern world in which we all live today. And I think I would like them to get an appreciation for the globality of it. And presumably your students are also very oriented towards the urban. And I think thinking about cotton is a good way to remember that the countryside and that agriculture actually does play still an important role in our modern world, even if most of us don't live in the countryside and most of us don't grow things. Yeah, I think that's an important point, especially on 7th Avenue and 27th Street in New York City. Uh, what about uh, you, Jeff? What would you like my students to know? I, I think I come at the, and one of the reasons I find this to be such an exciting panel is because we all see cotton through different lenses. Um, so I agree, and I think that it should be taught uh, the entire picture from farm all the way through retail. But what I would specifically like your students to know is especially those that are going to be uh, fashion designers or textile uh, fabric developers, uh, that unless they work for Pottery Barn or William Sonoma or some of the high-end brands, uh, they're going to be walking into a cotton and polyester world. And specifically, polyester has roughly 62% of the market. Cotton has just about 25% of the market. And fibers like wool, roughly 1%, flax even less than that. So they are going to have to deal with this. And at the rate things are going, polyester, if there are fiber wars, um, uh, polyester is winning. Um, and I think that they have to be aware of this, that this is the world they're going into. Okay, good. Buxton? Yeah, I'd like to uh, kind of uh, echo what 
Jeff is saying, I think it's so important for uh, your students to understand about fibers, uh, not just Supima, uh, not just cotton, but polyester, rayon, uh, wool, and really, because these are the building blocks uh, for them as designers. And it, it, if you were an architect, you know, you would need to know the difference between a concrete block and a plank of wood, you know, how, how can you be an architect without understanding materials? And I say it's, it's uh, so important for uh, designers or uh, merchants to really understand each of the fibers, uh, including cotton, and understand the impacts and trade-offs that are uh, in involved with each so that they can assess and in and, and this very uh, challenging environment that they have the knowledge to make their own decisions and observations and arrive at their own conclusions when they're trying to, you know, chart a, a sustainable course uh, in their collections. All right, good. Allison, <clears throat> excuse me. I think picking up on the theme of sustainability um, in cotton, there is a lot of attention to environmental sustainability, water usage, and other kinds of environmental impact, which I hope your students will. Consider, but there's also um, labor implications for cotton, and a lot of the a lot of the environmental standards don't actually capture labor in any significant way. Um, and thinking about again what Professor Beckert said about th it's important for students to understand the where this product is grown and um, the entire kind of commodity chain that it's a part of. It's also important to think about who is growing it, who is picking it. Um, where, what role they play in that um, commodity chain. You know, 1 of the things that I do now is work, uh, work to engage companies as they look at their sourcing um, to redirect sourcing in many cases away from uh, significant human rights impacts, uh, like in the weaker region. Um, and, and we find that many companies, many designers don't actually know uh, all the way down the chain where the raw material is from because it gets <laughs> commodified and spun and, and woven and and passed through third countries in many cases. So to keep those. Okay. And that that's a good segue to uh, what I was thinking about talking about next. My originally, I thought I was going to talk about why aren't we talking about cotton more? My shirt is cotton. My <laughs> undershirt is cotton. My underwear is cotton. I'm surrounded by cotton. Well, the only time I'm not surrounded by cotton is when I'm in the shower. But as soon as I get out, I dry myself in a cotton towel. Why aren't we talking more about cotton? I thought to me, this is, why isn't this? But then, of course, Tuesday, there was a front page article in the New York Times. And suddenly, and I think today, there are two more articles. And suddenly, cotton now um, is big, big news. Um, international trade and, and nationalism, et cetera, et cetera. And, I don't think I can share. It does that button seem not to work? But if I were going to share, I was going to show you a photo from Xinjiang province where it looks like people are uh, picking cotton by hand. They are picking cotton by hand. And New York Times is using the word uh, forced labor. And I just, how? And I wrote this article up in my class, and the first question students asked me, how can I avoid wearing clothes that comes from forced labor? How can I avoid wearing cotton pants that, that comes from people picking it like this? Is there a way? Who wants to start? I'll leave this open. Well, I'll take a shot at it. Um, first of all, as far as your original question about why we don't talk more about cotton, I think it has to do with the different circles that we travel in. I think if you asked my wife, she would say, I don't want to hear about cotton. Again, I've been hearing about it since 1983. <laughs> and most of these, most of the panels and discussions, uh, there's a lot of cotton talked about. I wish people would talk more about polyester. But as far as uh, Xinjiang, uh, it's going to be very difficult because not only is China well, right now they're the number two producer of cotton in the world, but um, uh, um, and India is number one. But they go back and forth one and two, and uh, they're also, I believe, still the largest importer of fibers. So it's going to be very hard to tell um, 
where the cotton is going, what cotton is. Nobody's going to stamp Xinjiang cotton on the bale. Nobody's going to put it on a label. So it's going to be very hard to tell uh, what's being uh, blended in the laydowns and, and what's going to appear in yarns and apparel and home furnishings fabrics. So I, I don't have an answer beyond that, that it's going to be very difficult. Yeah, I might be able to jump in at this point. Uh, you know, we talked about um, traceability as one of the topics for discussion. And that's an area that Supima has, uh, in my 20 years with Supima, I've spent every single one of them looking at different traceability solutions. And Supima, we're, uh, uh, we're uh, a brand that represents uh, extra long staple cotton that's grown in the United States. And so we have a particular interest in authenticity, authenticity and traceability because uh, our fiber is sold at a at a premium in the marketplace at a dollar seventy a pound versus uh, you know seventy cents per pound. So it's very important that we maintain the identity of our our cotton and that we prevent against blending. And so as a result, we've uh, uh, gone through a number of avenues of research, uh, pursued uh, DNA uh, analysis uh, that was just able to discern between regular cotton and extra long staple. But then uh, have recently partnered in the past three years with a company, uh, Oratane, out of New Zealand, that uh, is able to achieve authentication through forensic testing. And this is through uh, uh, measuring the uh, levels of 39 different isotopes and rare elements that are naturally occurring. And through that testing creates a unique fingerprint that can take the fiber back to its point of origin which allows us, and this is not through blockchain or certification, but that the fiber itself carries uh, the identity from where it's grown. And so this is something that uh, we actually have, this is not something for the future, but something that we are actually uh, implementing already and have a partnership with uh, the Caring Group they have are working with uh, a specific grower of ours in uh, La Union, uh, New Mexico. Uh, they mapped, we have mapped his specific farm and you can trace that cotton as it goes from his farm to the spinning mill, to the weaving mill, to the looms in uh, Italy where our, our licensed uh, partner Albini uh, makes it into beautiful shirting and, and onto, you know, Balenciaga, Saint Laurent, uh, those beautiful brands. So this is actually, uh, and this has taken a lot of work to do and really uh, incredible collaboration between partners. And, and we like to think there's one big happy family, but there's a lot of competition, you know, between the, the grower and the spinner and the weaver. Uh, and the brand, uh, but it, so it re requires an openness that really hasn't been common practice um, within the, the fashion world, but I think uh, shows a way forward that this is possible and, and really can be done if we work together uh, more collaboratively, uh, that you can take that fiber and identify it and you can test any item, any Supima item, you know, we work with, uh, 300 brands worldwide. You can test a Supima sock, a t-shirt, um, a dress shirt, a towel, and you can validate, take it back to the origin that it is Supima. So there is, there is, uh, there's no need to feel paralyzed that we can't do anything to navigate this. There are technologies and, and practices that I think uh, offer some, some hope. All right, very interesting. Allison, when, when I looked at this photo, uh, from China, this forced labor, or New York Times call it. Are are there other places where cotton is is picked this way, or is this unique for China? Do you think? Yeah, I just want I just want to be very clear. Since you brought up forced labor in your last question, I mean it is it is undeniable that um, there is systematic forced labor in cotton production in Xinjiang, um, as well as in uh, production of textiles. So 
forced labor is affecting not just the growing and the picking of cotton in the Xinjiang region, but also production of yarn, textiles, and finished garments. And I just, I just want to, so I, no, I, just, I just think it's really important because, no, you're, absolutely. You're, I agree with that, you. you know, they're calling it forced labor. It's, it's quite actually clear and. Um, so what I mean, what I meant by that is I'm not understand what's the difference between forced labor and slave labor. Why so, not call it slave labor? I mean, there, there are some legal differences and there are also some differences in how we understand remedy. Um, so forced labor is prohibited by an ILO, by two ILO conventions, it has two components. Forced labor to be considered as forced labor has to be both involuntary and under the threat of penalty so that the person doesn't want to do the work and they can't refuse to do the work. Otherwise, they'll suffer a, a consequence. Um, modern day, it is considered basically a form of modern day slavery. Um, but we consider labor abuses usually along a spectrum of abuses. Um, there are also a number of indicators that can be used to try to assess out, you know, where a labor abuse might fall on that spectrum. You know, can the per is the person subject to violence or some other kind of abuse, withholding of wages? Are they allowed to leave the facility that they are in? Um, abuse of vulnerability and, and those kinds of considerations. Um, and there's some difference when you think about remedy as well. Um, you had asked, is this unique to China or unique to the Xinjiang region? Sadly, no. Um, although the abuses that are being perpetrated there are uh, have a particular character. Um, I work on forced labor and cotton production specifically in Uzbekistan, where there was a state-sponsored mass scale system of forced labor in cotton production that has only been reforming in the last couple of years. And in Turkmenistan, where there continues to exist that state-sponsored sort of mass scale state production of, of the product. There's also forced labor that can occur in a non-state imposed um, way because through debt bondage and other kinds of forms. We see it in India and Pakistan and in other cotton producing countries as well. So, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Did someone say something? So, Sven, from why is it that cotton, why is it that cotton is so associated with slavery for? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a very good question. And, and, you know, obviously I cannot really speak uh, in, a, in, a, in a deeply informed way about the present situation, but, but what I can say and what I can confirm is that uh, that the history of uh, cotton agriculture has uh, contained for a very long time a heavy dose of uh, coercion and for a very long time, as you all know, a heavy dose of the enslavement of cotton growers, especially in the United States. But uh, if you look at the very long history of cotton, if you look at all four or 5,000 years of the history of cotton, then that kind of coercion came relatively late. It came in the 18th century, and it started in Brazil and the West Indies, and it migrated from there uh, into the United States. And of course, the reason for why that happened, I think, is that the uh, that, that demand for cotton in the late 18th century exploded in the wake of the British Industrial Revolution. It grew very, very rapidly. Uh, peasant producers in places like India, West Africa, Anatolia, and elsewhere uh, produced largely for their domestic consumption and not for export markets. And they were still quite powerful and they resisted a further production of cotton for export markets. And so it was that system of slave labor that had been invented in sugar agriculture in the Caribbean that then was applied to the sudden expansion of cotton agriculture in the 18th and then throughout the 19th century. And of course, uh, slave labor was, it, it, provided, uh, it provided the labor, you know, by, by, by enslaving the work day, it secured the, it, it secured the labor. And, and it was, of course, also a, a form of cheap labor that was, um, you know, that was characteristic for a particular moment in that history of capitalism. Obviously, it, 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 that, that particular form of, of, of coercion in labor relations in cotton agriculture came to an end in 1865 with the Emancipation Proclamation in the United States. Uh, 
but uh, but coercion, as Alison also just mentioned, coercion, of course, and forced labor could be applied in other ways. There was certainly a lot of forced labor in cotton agriculture after 1865, for example, in West Africa. Uh, and there was a lot of things such as deputage uh, uh, in, uh, in, for example, in India or also in Egypt in the later half of the 19th century. Um, but what I, I wanted to one, add one thing to the previous discussion, and that is, uh, yes, it's, it is important to trace uh, these commodity chains also for the reasons that we are just discussing. And indeed, in the 19th century, there were already people who were concerned with consuming slave-grown cotton. And in the 1830s, there was the English Ladies Free Labor Cotton Association. <laughs> uh, and they basically tried to do what many people try to do today, namely to trace where that cotton came from. And they tried not to consume cotton grown by enslaved people in the United States. So this has a long history in itself. All right. Very interesting. And that so, Jeff, I mean, you're on the spot here. Try to convince us to buy cotton. Yeah. Sounds like something we should avoid. Well, let me make my position clear, and I think I probably speak for the other panelists. I think that uh, all of us are against forced labor of any kind. Um, I think we all believe that. We're all trying to make it a little bit better. As a matter of fact, I'd like to also um, just mention that um, I believe Allison's program, the Cotton Campaign, um, is looked at by many of the people that I know is probably the most successful campaign of its kind. Um, uh, I don't know about in history, but in modern day. Um, and when I looked at the figures, I see that Uzbekistan, um, I believe that their cotton production is down roughly one half from where it was um, uh, about a decade ago. And I think they've moved that into, and correct me if I'm wrong, Allison, but I think citrus and wheat. and um, and they've it's a better deal for them so i don't really have any way to say buy cotton that is not produced appropriately so they're you know uh, as i said i i stand against forced labor i think everybody on the panel does so but what would you tell companies to do i mean what would you h m now is saying that they're not going to sell or buy any cotton from from china but we've heard here that you can't trace it what would I say to H and M? I yeah. don't know what I would say to H and M. They're in a very tough spot. Um, it's not just them; it's a bunch of other companies, and there's going to be more companies. Uh, whether they have the ability to stand up to it and um, infuriate the Chinese consumer, which is also going on right now because of that, um, it, it's a really tough one. And uh, I'm glad in, I'm not in that part of the business. So I guess I don't have a comment for you. <laughs> All right. Does, does anyone... I, I guess I would just jump in and say I, I, I do think you know companies are going to have to pay attention, as they probably should have been from the very beginning, to where they're sourcing their raw materials. Uh, you can't make any claims about sustainability if you don't know where your raw materials come from. Uh, where does the oil come from for polyester? Where does uh, the trees come from for rayon? How is the cotton grown? The cultivation practices, and so. Uh, I think it's it's uh, a real uh, opportunity for companies to get to know their supply chains. Uh, in the United States, we have, uh, and uh, subpoena, subpoena, specifically, we have, uh, they were highly regulated, and that's a good thing that, you know, there's a lot of controls, uh, both, um, you know, labor uh, practices, uh, environmental practices. There are over 600 pages of regulations. Uh, that one must adhere to in, in the state of California, not just US EPA, but California EPA uh, to make us the most regulated cotton industry in the world. It's all the cotton is uh, uh, mechanized uh, in terms of the picking. So that element, you know, kind of is, is, is really removed there. So, you know, but that's just our specific situation. I think that companies need to look at where their raw materials are coming from and understand uh, the sourcing and uh, ask the tough questions if they don't feel like they're getting the answers that they need. Allison, if you were on the board of H&M, what would you say? Yeah, I mean, let's let's be really clear. I mean, H&M and all of the companies now that are producing fast fashion or luxury garments using using textiles have to have visibility of their supply chains. 
This, this is not a new obligation. I think the Uyghur crisis has just shown a light on what a deep crisis it is for, for companies. Um, but they have, they have serious binding commitments. They have modern day forced slavery statements. They're the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Individual jurisdictions like the US have very strict um, regulations. There is no world in which H&M can source materials now that are made from Xinjiang, for example. Um, without, for example, being in violation of a U.S. import ban on cotton from that region. What they have to do is know their supply chain. And so that the, the crisis that they're facing is, is actually just a public relations one, and it's, it's a commercial one. You know, can, can they continue to sell products to a Chinese consumer base, or are they going to be in compliance with international law? Um, and so what I would tell H&M is to keep doing what you're doing. Um, redirect your sourcing, know your supply chain, um, and be in compliance with international law. This is a profound moral test for companies. And, and you think it's everyone on the panel thinks it's possible for H and M. And I'm just using H and M as an example to know where their cotton come from. They 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 can trace it back so, to the so companies have 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 a responsibility to do due diligence, and the issue now in Xinjiang in the Uyghur region is that they can't do effective due diligence. They can't in any meaningful way credibly investigate their supply chains. They can't send in auditors. They can't interview workers um, because of repressive policies that prevent people from speaking to auditors because auditing companies are no longer able to function there. Uh, so in that sense, they, yes, they, they can know, and because they can't do the due diligence, they have to redirect their sourcing. Okay. So another, another issue that I faced in my class the other day, when I started to talk about this and I sh I showed my students this article and I started to talk about China and forced labor and et cetera, et cetera. And I found myself gliding into sort of anti-Asian. And I started to get very concerned that I was fueling Asian hate. And I started to wonder how far can I push this without getting myself in trouble? And is this, is this a concern? Should, should I have this concern or should I simply state what's going on and and i understand this is not really your fields necessarily but i'm just curious if you have an opinion and there's silence i have an opinion but um i think of course you're right to be concerned about about being careful not to fuel racism that's that's a critical um, consideration, but I think the very same human rights principles that are anti racist are also the same human rights principles that can identify. Other abuses, and in this case, abuses of the Uyghur population that are uh, ethnically fueled. So, I think there's a way that we can use universal standards to understand both uh, Asian racism, but also the crimes against humanity that, that are being perpetrated uh, against the Uyghurs. Carl, um, I understand uh, the the dilemma that you're describing, uh, but the one thing that I have to uh, again stress is that uh, China produces about 24, 25 percent of the world's cotton, um, and about 85 or 90 percent of it comes out of Xinjiang. And so it's not just product that's coming out of China; it's coming out of Vietnam; it's coming out of lots of other places. Um, and so it's it's not that it's not the right thing to do. It's it's going to be very difficult to do. I think that what Buxton said about traceability, uh, I think that um, I think that's the way of the future, and that's really the hope for it. Yeah, it's it's very tough. I mean, uh, to 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 talk from the production standpoint, uh, cotton really, and Alison, you touched on this briefly. It loses its identity once it's uh, spun into yarn. That you have that opening room in the spinning uh, uh, factory where you have 25 bales of cotton that are laid out and the machine passes over the top of them, takes off the top 
one inch to create a blend. Uh, unless you have somebody in there 24 seven, you know, drinking coffee, staying awake, you don't know where those 25 bales came, came from. And it's very, even though, you know, it doesn't matter what they have in the warehouse, you have those, those 25 bales and five might be from Egypt. Five might be from the U S five might be from Xinjiang. You, you don't know. Um, but I guess the issue, what the, they purchased. But guess, the, bales, the bales are usually labeled um, with information about the gin and gin cotton is usually ginned quite close to where it is grown. So we actually, right. we actually do have a lot of information about what is going into the spinner. And there's a, there's a new program. A colleague of mine is, is rolling out um, that is looking at traceability from the spinner level. And there are other programs that look at farm to gin level. <laughs> I mean, to say this can't be, a, a company can tell us that a factory that produced a breakfast cereal also produce, you know, produces gluten-free or sesame or whatever. Companies can do this. They absolutely can. I mean, there's a, there's a large company that we're working with as part of our coalition to end forced labor in the Uyghur region where we have a specific set of demands to companies. And we know in, in a lot of detail what this what steps this company has taken to put in traceability and, and really robust traceability measures. It's not easy, it's not inexpensive, um, but they can do it. Now, Sven, you, you spoke earlier about the sort of boycott slave cotton. Can you was, was that effective? How did they know it was American cotton? Was that can can we learn anything from that today? That's a, that's a good question. And was it effective? No, this did not end slavery. I think it probably was part of a, an emerging, wider conversation about uh, the evils of slavery and the need to bring slavery to an end. But uh, but but the consumption choice itself, I don't think, brought slavery. Uh, to an end in the United States. I think what they tried to do is they tried to purchase uh, goods made out of uh, Indian or Egyptian cotton, and they basically boycotted our cotton coming from the United States because they reasonably assumed that it was grown by enslaved workers. So, um, you know, I mean, I think we, in in some ways, we can learn from that in in the sense that that there has been. You know, not just a long history of coercion and violence and enslavement in the cotton agriculture, but there has also been a long history of trying to do something about it. And there has been even a long history of consumer activism. And we know, you know, we, we know that slavery eventually did come to an end. And, uh, and it did come to an end, not because it wasn't profitable or because it didn't produce sufficient quantities of cotton for global markets. It came to an end because People opposed slavery. The people protested it. So, uh, uh, and that had uh, political implications, especially uh, then in the United States. So, um, I think we can, in, in that way, we can learn from it. I don't think consumption, uh, polit consumption boycotts themselves. I don't think solve all the world's problems, but but they can be part of a solution to the world's problems. Carl, I think that uh, also. Another point that I'd like to stress is that um, if cotton were to go away tomorrow, there's no other fiber that could really scale up uh, to the volume and the production that would be needed other than polyester, maybe nylon, uh, a little bit of rayon, uh, but it really drops off after you get past the market share of polyester and the market share of cotton. Uh, it's not like all of a sudden we could start growing enough flax or enough hemp or enough anything to make the problems go away. Listen, listen, Jeff, I'm all with you. I'm, I mean, I hate polyester and don't get me started on the others. You know, I, so <laughs> I'm, you, you have no uh, enemy in me. I'm all for cotton, but I wanted my, I want to buy the right cotton. Yes. Yes. So, so what, what should I, as a consumer, what should I do here? Speak to Alison. What, when I go, um, you know, I went to Sarah yesterday. I saw a, a suit that was made in Morocco. And I understand that's nothing to do where the cotton comes from, but what am I going to do here? I think you have to look for traceability. I mean, I, and honestly, that's, 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 that
invested a lot uh, in, in providing the consumer with confidence that, they're, that they know where the product comes from. Uh, you can look, I know that, you know, U.S. cotton industry is also doing a lot to, you know, uh, uh, pursuing the trace, same traceability technology that we are. And hopefully this becomes an industry standard around the world so that you can make that uh, decision. I mean, sure. uh, but I will say just, you know, make a, a broader comment, you know, as, as hard as our uh, family farms work, uh, adhering, you know, using, you know, mechanized picking, latest technology, GPS driven tractors that cost a, a million bucks a piece, uh, rotating crops to keep the soil in balance is, is with all that work they do, uh, they get a world price. They don't get one penny more uh, for all their efforts uh, to be sustainable, to have minimal impact on the environment. And, and that's all said in the context that at the final product level, or uh, in a finished garment, the raw material probably makes up at most 10% of that total cost. So you're really talking about, you know, a dime or, you know, maybe a quarter or less um, in terms of a, a price going up or down. So let me uh, ask then, you. In a way, if, that pressure, yeah, really. If I, if I wanted to buy a T-shirt that supi my cotton, how much more expensive would that be? It's probably going to be, uh, it depends which brand, uh, but, you know, Uniqlo has been a great, you know, partner. Their t-shirts are around uh, 9 or $10 each versus you could get one for, you know, 6 or 7 just depending on a basic t-shirt. So it's going to be about 20, 20% more, and certainly you can get to, to premium brands. Uh, but so in a way, there's a lot that needs to change around consumer behavior and that these bargains that people get uh, through fast fashion and they're able to get these, you know, deals, uh, they really are, um, you know, uh, the product of, of uh, work conditions uh, that, you know, across the supply chain or that no one would really want to know about. Um, there's a way that they make it so cheap and it's not a way that, most people would be comfortable with if they really thought about it. And I think consumers have to be aware and pressure uh, retailers to, to really you know, be more transparent about how things are made and where they're coming from. Okay. And yeah. that's, that's, that's not something that, you know, and Sven, you can speak to this, that, you know, the farmers, they, you know, uh, cotton farmers have no pricing power in the market anymore that, that boom that that came and just made it you know you were kind of silly if you didn't grow cotton because you could get, make returns that were just exponentially below uh, above what you could make growing any other crop that time is, has really passed and our cotton farmers everybody thinks about you know a cotton farmer that just grow cotton not today our farmers grow tomatoes they grow pistachios almonds um lettuce all you know they basically stock the shelves of uh whole foods uh these are you know gourmet uh uh food products and i guess that makes us gourmet cotton but you know they're very sophisticated and are always rotating their crops i know that dan asked us if there were any questions from the audience and if there are any. Yeah, we're, we're asking audience members to put questions in the chat. So we do have a question from Joy Mao. Can a company like H&M simply source all their cotton from Supima or is there a significant scale slash price barrier? We would love that, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, and we are more expensive and uh, it's, uh, we're, we're literally just 3% of the cotton production in the United States uh, and less than 1% of the world production. And, and, and that said, we still, uh, our growers are very progressive in, in their um, techniques and have made their priority to develop traceability through significant uh, financial investment. 
Um, but, um, you know, uh, this is something that's really important. We, we have a lot to showcase in terms of how we grow our cotton and a, a great story to tell. We certainly, if we had a lot to hide, we wouldn't be uh, so focused on uh, traceability and transparency. There aren't any other questions in the chat right now, but I'm going to ask a question. Um, Carl mentioned the cotton gin right at the beginning, and the cotton gin is sort of a classic example in business history of a bottleneck and how technology solves bottlenecks in production. Are there any bottlenecks in cotton production right now that need a technological solution or some other kind of solution? Well, Dan, I'm not sure if this is the question that you're asking, but uh, I will say that, uh, and it was kind of mentioned quickly before, but I believe that over 50% of the world still picks cotton by hand. Um, mechanization exists exists here in the US, in Brazil, in, in Australia, a uh, couple of other countries, but by and large, it's still hand-picked cotton. So I don't know if that's what you were getting to or... You know. Definitely, um, right. but and the, the technology know. exists. I mean, the technology <laughs> exists, but it's very expensive technology. But I'll leave it. Uh, Al Allison, I would just say that um, you know, uh, mechanization works on larger plots of land, larger farms. The cotton has the fields have to be prepared for mechanized picking. The cotton has to be planted in with certain rows facing. So, you know, on a family farm in India, that's a hectare small or two or two hectares. Um, mechanization isn't going to work for a lot of the mid holder farms or medium medium holder farms that we work with in central Asia. Mechanization really. Wouldn't necessarily work and hand picking is an important source of cash income for rural rural people in those communities and particularly women. So there's nothing inherently wrong with cotton picking as a form of labor. Um, what is inherently wrong is forcing people to do it or not paying them to do it or forcing them to do it in abusive conditions. So I, for a long time, have advocated uh, to the international financial institutions and to others who kind of see mechanization as a silver bullet to, to address labor abuses, um, actually to think about, simply just think about the labor. Um, there's, there's no reason that cotton can't be sustainably and ethically grown by small holders and, and picked and hand picked because the other, on the flip side of that is you're looking at industrial farming, which, which can be quite disruptive to rural economies and rural livelihoods. I would agree with that. I would also add that, um, I believe that the average farm size in China is, um, about, um, uh, it's less than one acre. Um. And the average farm size uh, in the U.S. is about 1,693 acres. Um, Australia, it's about 1,113 1, acres. So it's everybody thinks of cotton as this huge monocrop, and it is that in certain countries. But that's not the profile of it in the 80, the 80 countries or so where it's grown. I talked to an Uzbek farmer who had been on a study program to the U.S., and he, I said, asked him what he thought about it, and he said, it looks so lonely <laughs> uh, because it was sort of one guy driving a big, a big, tra a big tractor around, and he was used to a, a you know, a s small farm with, you know, the village kind of coming in to pick. <laughs> and I was on a farm about two years ago uh, in North Carolina, where uh, the farm was uh, managed by four full-time people and. Um, I believe six part-time people and it's 10,000 acres and that's it. And you're telling me that the price for cotton is the same. Unless it's Supima, the, the American farmer gets the same amount as the Indian farmer. Well, I, I world, don't know the I world price. That. We, we have a different price because it's an extra long staple cotton. Right, so I that, understand Supima you know, is different. Uh, Right. But what I will say is that when I was beginning my career in cotton in the 80s, the price was about 60 to 70, per, 60 to 70 cents per pound. And now I think it's about 75 cents per pound this week, somewhere around there. So it has not kept kept up with inflation or with anything. Um, 
it's still very cheap. And the reason oh. why people are still in it is because they can improve the productivity uh, by things that we were talking that we were going to talk about today, such as genetically modified cotton and different uh, farming techniques and all of that. But but even as cheap as cotton is, and uh, it still is not as cheap as polyester. And so that really has been a big challenge uh, that, um, and that's really what's, that's been the jet fuel for the fast fashion industry yeah. that allows them to just churn out these outfits that one can wear on Saturday night and pitch on Sunday morning, if you wear it at all. And I think that's been a real okay. challenge. Right. And, and, you know, you'd ask me about, you know, marketing a, a premium fiber. I mean, it's, it's, if you're building a wardrobe, there's a great, you know, uh, argument, you know, for investing in special pieces that are going to last and wear well, but if you're just buying and you treating fashion as disposable, who cares? You know, I just, I just want, it doesn't have to be that comfortable. I don't have, I'm not concerned how well it washes or holds color because I'm just wearing it for Saturday night. And after that, it's, it's, uh, in the bin and on its way to the landfill. A lot no, I think, of those, also, may, I'm sorry. If I may, I think that's a good point. And, and I think what this points to is that, 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 the, that the kind of wasteful consumption of textiles that many have gotten used to is, is not sustainable, not on a social basis, but also not on an ecological basis. Uh, I mean, how to address that problem is of course, you know, it's not easily solved. But I just saw in the chat, I saw a really interesting comment, uh, which relates to your question about, uh, you know, how should you bring this to the classroom? How should you uh, bring that story to future fashion designers? And, and the person in the chat mentions that they, you know, a good idea would be to bring your students and to show them where this stuff comes from that they work with, you know, both the field and the factory. And I think that's actually an excellent idea. Because I think- yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think that's a great- uh, I agree. I think that's a great point. And that's actually Supima for uh, the past 14 years, we've uh, organized a uh, design competition. And so we've uh, partnered with FIT and I will give you a little plug here uh, that uh, FIT and uh, Carl, uh, uh, Jeff, you know, this uh, FIT has won the competition, you know, three, three times more than any other school. We're not going to name names. But we, we, as part of this competition, we have the finalists from each school, but we also go in and teach uh, classes uh, on, give a, a Supima 101, but not only talk about uh, Supima cotton, but other cottons to help people understand, you know, where it comes from, how it's grown, and how decisions around raw materials really impact the end product and to, to pick the right raw material for whatever their design. So I think, you know, getting that education is just so important. So, and I agree. If I may throw in a plug for TDM at this point, uh, the textile yes. development <laughs> department for 15 years, uh, we had a denim project, which is still going on, uh, that's focused on cotton. And every year we took um, the graduating seniors, we took them to North Carolina to visit a cotton farm, different farm every time. Uh, that was that was um, part of a cotton incorporated grant. Uh, so we do take we I agree 100 percent. They need to see what a farm is. Many of them have never been on a farm. Uh, they need to see what it is they hear about and uh, they need to walk in the field and, and see what it's like to pick a bowl of cotton. It's it's you know, it's no fun. I mean, it's fun for 10 minutes, but maybe it's not so much fun after that. So I believe in yes, in experiential education for sure. Yeah, I do too. I, I uh, normally bring in uh, the cotton fiber uh, into the class and show them when, when we talk about civil war. Yeah, I, I can do that. I always travel with my little cotton babe. So. Oh, and yeah. so I bring in I'll send you a replacement. I, replacement. I, I bring in Sven's book. With that little bale, it's... Yeah. Uh, all right, anything? Else? Do I see something? Uh, would I see something in the chat popping up? Just says North Carolina trip. Hope the class trips are going to back, they're going to come back soon. Yeah, we can't travel to North Carolina right now unless we're already there. 
All right, let me um, ask, ask all the panelists. Uh, we're starting to come to an end. And is there something you want to say that you want to say and that you didn't have a chance to say? So, Allison, I will start with you. Um, I don't know. I would say that um, that really there there's been a lot of talk about how some of this is hard, and I think that that's true. But I think it's all possible. I think it's impo I think it's possible to have ethically and sustainably sourced raw materials. I think it's possible for companies to know about it. Um, and I think it's possible for design students and for brands who use these materials also to be aware of what's happening in their supply chains and for us as consumers to, you know, pressure our own governments to have more robust um, enforcement of, of labor laws. All right, very good. Sven? Um, maybe just in so far as that we, uh, you know, we should be critical about what is happening in the world today, but we should not forget our own history. So we should not just point at others, but we should also remember what we did ourselves. And second, I agree with Alison. We can do better and we should endeavor to do better. Let, let me ask you this. How long did sharecropping go on for? When was the last sharecropper? When did sharecropping disappear? I mean, it became much less important, uh, basically, in um, in the 1930s, 1940s. But I don't know. I don't know when the last sharecropper. Okay. I mean, maybe there's still a few around today. I don't know. So. Um, okay. All right, Jeff. Uh, yeah, I, I think that. Um, Something that I wish that we had been able to get to uh, was was not only the production technologies like organic and uh, non GMO and GMO, uh, because there's a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, I think the NGOs do a good job, but I think that um, in some cases, um, I believe that there's a lot of misinformation about water um, about. Um, GMO once again about production about um, about market share about all of that stuff and I wish we had a chance to dig into that yeah well we will return to this subject cotton is not something cotton isn't going away am I right Buxton cotton is here to stay oh, it's, it's 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 here to stay <laughs> but be. yeah there's there's challenges but I I, I guess my my uh, final word would really be um, just there's a, an incredible story uh, about what's happening today with cotton and the uh, uh, application of technologies um, and uh, advancing the, the the agricultural practices, crop rotation, all that that I think is productive to 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 revisit. Uh, but you know the future is really in the hands of your students, and there's such an opportunity to have a huge impact right now. And make a big change in how business uh, has, is is transacted in the in the fashion industry, and so you know you're at a great school. This is an incredible program. I've been able to teach you know Jeff's class and and uh, and a lot of the design classes, and so I think this is it's an exciting time to be uh, studying what you're studying, and I think you really have have a big opportunity to have a huge impact. And how things are done in the future. So, uh, and I certainly, you know, would would be happy to help out with more information for anyone who's interested. Great. Well, I appreciate you. I think this has been very informative. I don't care about anyone else. It's been informative for me, and I learned a lot that I will bring into my classroom. Uh, the, the idea that fifty percent of cotton is still handpicked. Uh, it's very surprising to me. I just did not realize that it was that amount. Anyway, I want to thank all okay. you panelists. And I don't know if Dan wants to say anything. Sure, I'll say thank you also. And this is the last panel of our two day symposium. So thank you to everybody who came. But we do have one more session after this one. We're all going to stay in the same place. For those of you who would like to stay, we're going to talk about what we learned from the whole two days, what Kyung-hee and I have learned from the past three years of trying to create more curriculum 
to teach art and design students about business and labor history and business and labor practices. So if anybody would like to hang out with us, we're going to run from four till maybe five o'clock talking about what we do next. And we're going to turn everybody's microphone on for this one. So everybody's going to get an opportunity to talk.